Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar called Data Privacy in Managing Subscriptions, What You Need to Know to Protect Personal Information. My name is Judy Lau. I'm the Director for Asia in, uh, for One if IFRA in Singapore. Uh, and with me today is my team, uh, Wilson, Jen, Serene, and Cheryl. So warm welcome to all of you. We've got uh, participants from about a dozen countries signed up, such as China, Fiji, India, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Myanmar, uh, Philippines, Singapore, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, and as far as Germany and Mozambique. So welcome to this session. Please feel free to drop your names uh, into the chat box as well to introduce yourself. This is a webinar format, so uh, unfortunately we can't really see each other uh, in within this room, but uh, you know, feel free to just uh, drop in your your um, your title and your name and, and uh, where you're from as well, what company and what you do. Uh, this is, of course, a topic which isn't very much uh, talked about in the news industry. I don't know, maybe it's because we are, you know, it's sort of something that can be taken for granted. It's something that maybe we're not too sure which department it sort of sits in, whether it's in IT, whether it's in editorial, you know, whether it's in know, business, because you know, the, the, the product owners are the business on the business side of things. But uh, it's something that as we grow our subscriptions in, in the news industry, as we have gathered mailing lists of you know, hundreds of thousands of readers and users as we have messaging apps uh, where we collect mobile phone numbers. This issue of um, what to do with all this personally identifiable information becomes even more important in what, how to deal with it. Uh, we have today a panel of speakers uh, from around the region. Uh, and we have Raju Chalam, who's our uh, trainer and our, uh, our panelist from Singapore. Uh, that's on the next slide, uh, as well as uh, Nicholas Sagal from uh, Malaysia, as well as Gemma Mendoza in the Philippines. Uh, Raju himself uh, is a former, first knew him as the, uh, the business IT editor in the Business Times in Singapore. Uh, and uh, since then, you know, he's got on to, to many things in the IT industry. He's now the chief editor of AI and ethics and governance body of knowledge. This is a um, say a publication, but it's an online uh, repository of, of body of knowledge of information around AI ethics and governance. Um, Raju himself is also uh, a fellow in several organizations. And um, let's just try to make sure I get all this right because it's a long list. Uh, he is uh, the, uh, an honorary chair of the Cloud and Data Standards under IT Standards Committee and uh, the fe a fellow of the Singapore Computer Society, as well as a fellow of the Advanced Computing for Executives in the NUS School of Computing. And uh, Nicholas himself is Chief Product Officer of Ref Media Group and President of the Asian Digital Association. And joining us uh, from the Philippines later will be uh, Gemma Mendoza, the Head of Research and Strategy of Rappler. So we'll start off with um, a session of about uh, 20, 20, 30 minutes by Raju uh, on the landscape and what's out there before we uh, go into the panel discussion where we will invite you, the audience, to put in your questions in the Q&A box uh, for our panelists. And also feel free anytime to drop in your questions and we will come to them later. So now, Raju, over to you. Okay, thanks, uh, Juni. It's a pleasure and an honor to be on this Vanipra panel today. I'm going to share my slides and I'm going to go off video because I want you to look at the slides and not at me. So after I am done, I will put on my video for the panel discussion. So let me switch off my video first and share my screen. Okay, dealing with data privacy, uh, I have only about 12 slides and let's get on with it. I have them in this order. We are going to go first look at the ASEAN landscape then the APEC landscape very quickly. Baseline Singapore, Malaysia, cloud cybersecurity, what are the issues there? Data framework, mainly Singapore, EU GDPR, what are the issues there? and two or three final slides. And here's my credentials. So as Juni has already mentioned, uh, I do a few things in my free time. This means I have a lot of free time. Okay, let's get on with the next topic, ASEAN. ASEAN has Singapore, which has its own Data Protection Act, 
which is a PDPA, which came into force in 2014, implemented by the Personal Data Protection Commission. Uh, it was actually started in 2012, and we will go into a specific slide on that. Malaysia started much before Singapore, about two years before. It's implemented by the Personal Data Protection Department. Then we have Indonesia, which has its own Ministry of Info and Communications Regulation, number 20, started in 2016. It's quite comprehensive, but enforcement is quite weak. So there are a lot of issues uh, where data privacy standards are not met by most companies. You have the Philippine Data Privacy Act passed in 2012, came into effect in September 2016. It's enforced by the National Privacy Commission. However, uh, enforcement is lagging or sometimes erratic. And we have somebody from the Philippines, Emma, who will talk more about the Philippines. Vietnam has a very comprehensive law on cyber info security that was passed in 2015. Uh, it's quite comprehensive and it takes a lot of elements from the EU uh, GDPR. However, enforcement is quite lagging. So Vietnam uh, and <clears throat> Philippines, Indonesia are probably in the same boat. Myanmar, the reason I put it here is because there is a specific privacy and security of citizens law and journalists have been uh, arrested or taken to task for uh, various reasons. Some of them for breaching the Official Secrets Act, some of them for not divulging where they got their information from and so on. But as we all know, Myanmar is right now in the grip of the military rule. So the military decides who gets prosecuted and who doesn't. Okay, let's look at APEC. APEC is a very important uh, standard. It's called the APEC Cross-Border Privacy Rules, CBPR. APEC CBPR is based on the APEC Privacy Framework and features nine privacy principles, accountability, prevent harm, notice, and so on. The important thing here is APEC CBPR is enforceable. It's voluntary. It is international because it is cross countries. It is accountancy based system and it covers 21 APEC nations. Now, why is this important? Because it's the only framework with independent accountability and oversight elements. The only framework in ASEAN and APEC, right? CBPR has enforcement elements and thus it's a powerful means of demonstrating protection for subscriber data and all other data. Now, the good thing or the bad thing about this is there are some agencies which are certified uh, for CBPR compliance and countries can actually transmit PII or sensitive data across borders as long as they comply with CDPR and as long as they are certified as being compliant by the agency appointed by APEC. That's why it's, it's a very important standard. Uh, it doesn't come up very much in discussions because most people don't know it exists. Uh, Singapore endorses APEC CDPR for overseas transfers of PII, which is personally identifiable information and organizations in Singapore can transfer PII data to overseas certified recipients without meeting additional requirements in the sense that they don't have to comply with any other standards as long as they comply with APEC CBPR. Malaysia was also supposed to be in a similar situation, but since the change of the government, we don't know what is the direction that Malaysia is taking. So I can only speak about Singapore. Uh, and you can see Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, United States, all of these are members of the APEC, uh, APEC uh, consortium. 
Uh, I am also on the APEC Advisory Panel International for Big Data Analytics and for uh, privacy related issues. So that's the reason I think we got to take uh, all of these uh, APEC countries seriously because cross border transfer of data is permissible and that's a very new revelation, right? Okay, let's go to Singapore first. Singapore has the PDPA, which was started in 2012, came into effect in 2016. What is PII? PII includes full name, NRIC or passport number, picture or video of the individual, mobile phone, personal email, thumbprint, and residential address. Now, under PDPA, you don't need to have all of these together. You can have a single element and you are non-compliant. So that's an important distinction that we need to remember. You can request a correction of an error in your PII held by an organization, which is a, a print or online organization. And that's called a primary organization because primary organization is defined as one which primarily collects your data at the point where you give the data voluntarily like you fill in a subscription form to that primary subscri subscriber and you become an opt-in customer of that publication and the primary organization should correct the data and send it to organizations or specific organizations which have received the PII from the primary organization this normally happens when companies have multiple websites across multiple countries and all of them share the common database, right? So when one uh, data element is changed, it's the responsibility of the primary organization to ensure that the data is changed across the board. Breach notification guidelines have been updated very recently in March. So organizations must notify PDPC plus state care response. Care response is how have they managed to contain the breach? What assessment have they done about how the breach occurred? And a detailed report about how it occurred, what precautions are they taking, and who have they informed about the breach? And finally, evaluation of how not to ensure that this breach, I mean, how to ensure that this breach does not recur. Uh, so that needs to be given in a certain format to PDPC. Maximum penalty for contravening PDPA is 10% of an organization's annual turnover in Singapore dollars uh, or Sing dollar 1 million, whichever is higher. There are two cases which I must uh, let you know. The maximum fine levied by PDPC in Singapore has been Singtel so far, $2 million for various data breaches across the last couple of years. And IHIS, which is the integrated health information system, which had a major uh, hacking incident, and it was fined $1 million, Singapore dollars, by the PDPC. So it's not, uh, it's not just on paper, it has teeth, it is enforceable, and it is strictly enforced in Singapore. Therefore, all the companies who operate out of Singapore and collect PII in Singapore have to be very cautious about uh, controlling access to PII. <clears throat> Let's go quickly to Malaysia. I won't spend much time because we have uh, Nicholas from Malaysia on the panel. So the PDPA was uh, first initiated in 2010. What is PII, full name, residential address, passport number, and email? Now, what's the difference between Singapore and Malaysia in PDPA? Malaysia's PDPA defines what is sensitive PII, which is the information about physical, mental health condition of the individual, political opinions, religious beliefs, or other beliefs, or alleged offense or any other PII published in the government gazette. Now, this is considered sensitive PII and there are special provisions dealing with sensitive PII compared to normal PII. Uh, 
uh, in the PDPA in the Malaysian side. There is no need so far to notify authorities regarding data breaches, which I think is a loophole, but it's not for me to comment. They have a plan to have data breach notification modeled on EU GDPR, and I will come to EU GDPR in a in a minute. Uh, maximum financial penalty for contravening PDPA in Malaysia is 300,000 ringgit fine and or imprisonment for up to two years. But as far as I know, and I could be wrong, there have been no convictions so far. Uh, nobody has been fined this amount or jailed. Uh, and I may be wrong. So we will come to that in the panel discussion perhaps. Okay, let's go next to cloud. The reason I want to show cloud is because all of the workloads are going on cloud and we have a lot of uh, attendees today uh, on who are from platforms who have online publications who are 100% on cloud. They don't have any other uh, print or, uh, or related publications. Therefore, this is very important because on the cloud, you have hackers and you have data which can be pilfered from your site, either through employees carelessness or through some automated mechanism where you send out a PII information with emails to everybody and things like that. The reason I mention this is because website and web apps for instance, where all of the online publications reside, 53% of the uh, applications are on cloud and 13% are planning to migrate as soon as possible. However, from a uh, systems point of view, as far as I know, 100% of publications are on public clouds. So you have a special responsibility to ensure that the data you collect online because your your readers can come from all over the world and if you are not compliant with gdpr for instance and you have readers coming from europe you could be in non compliance and gdpr rules are very very strict and enforced very rigorously especially with large entities so i'll show you some data on gdpr in a while cyber security this is the most important reason. There are three stages of subscriber data to be monitored. Data at rest, which is in databases, which is normally secured. Data in motion, which goes via the network, where sometimes it can be hacked in an attack called man in the middle uh, attack or man in the browser attacks, which are quite common, but uh, that normally happens in uh, large entities like say there were a few cases of subscriber data in the US being attacked uh, been breached and the reason they do that is not because they want all your information but they just want your credit card information and then uh, if they get that that's that's good enough for a hacker to do some more mischief right data at end point is really data sitting in in the client's laptop or desktop or phone and if that is breached it's not really your responsibility because you don't have uh, coverage of people's end point devices however data at rest which is in your database and data in motion which is going or coming from your network either on the cloud or in premise makes you or your, your company liable in case there is a breach. Therefore, ensure that you have uh, strict cybersecurity protocols in place and strict policies. Uh, the best way to do this is to ensure that PII data is locked away in a vault, which is not accessible to everyone and doesn't need to be accessible to everyone, <laughs> right? So just, just a quick idea on cybersecurity. Okay, let's look at the data framework from IMDA. So IMDA has come up with this uh, great data framework, which is the trusted data sharing framework. Now the reason for, uh, one second, the reason for 
showing you this is because a lot of countries are looking seriously at implementing this data framework. Uh, it has got a data sharing strategy. It has legal and regulatory considerations. It has uh, technical and organization considerations about how to deal with data, sensitive data, how to operationalize and share data and so on. Even though it is from a purely Singapore perspective, all of these standards and all of these uh, protocols are adaptable across the world. And uh, I work closely with IMBA on the AI ethics. Uh, and we, we do a lot of discussions on data sharing with total uh, compliance to either APEC or to GDPR. Uh, this, for, for anyone who's interested, you can just go to Google and type in IMDA data, uh, trusted data sharing framework. It will get you to a, a landing site where you can download the entire PDF document and go through each of these sections. Uh, it's very nicely laid out. It's very simple to understand. And it has got uh, various examples of how you could be in breach of data in case your subscriber data is pilfered or compromised. Okay, let's go fast. Okay, GDPR is, is a very, very important uh, framework. General Data Protection Regulation, it was started in 2016, uh, but started implementing only in 2018. So what is PII? Its name, identity number, location data, online identifier which expresses the physical, physiological, genetic, mental, commercial, cultural or social identity of natural person. The reason people don't like GDPR is because of clause number four, because it covers a whole lot of things which are not really uh, the responsibility of the organization that's collecting all the data. For instance, how would you know that you're not collecting genetic or mental or commercial cultural identity of a person who is based in the UK uh, or US, sorry, in uh, Europe? Uh, and you may be in, in non-compliance because you inadvertently uh, took in data that you were not supposed to take. So there are some programs available for parsing out PII data in the EU framework. Uh, if your company is doing business in the EU, including in the UK, which, uh, which is not part of EU now, however, e UK also follows all of the guidelines of GDPR, and it's now called the UK GDPR or the UK uh, privacy standards. Now, as you can see below, uh, $17.5 million of 4%, sorry, 17.5 million British pounds of 4% of worldwide sales per annum, whichever is higher is the fines that are liable to be paid in the UK, which is comparable to EU's 20 million euro of 4% of worldwide sales. The most important clause here is PII breaches must be reported to the supervisory authority and impacted natural persons within 72 hours. Many companies fail to do this and therefore come under stricter penalty clauses, which the EU enforces very rigorously, uh, no matter who you are, which country you come from, as long as you are doing business in the EU, you are liable if you are not compliant. So two examples uh, I want to give you. Uh, one example is, of course, the British airline. British Air in 2020 had a massive breach, which is 400,000 records were leaked. The original fine that the EU wanted to levy on British Air was 183 million pounds, which would have bankrupted British Air. Because of COVID and because of appeals, it was brought down to 20 million pounds, which uh, the British Air paid. So if you want to see which are the 
country, companies in breach. Uh, you can also find companies like Google and Microsoft and Alibaba and so on. Uh, their names are all on the EU website. You just have to go to the EU website. You can download all of the guidelines of the GDPR for free. Nothing is chargeable. Uh, so please take note of this and download it if you are doing business in the EU. Okay, last couple of slides. Final slide one. The best way to deal with all of this is to have service level agreements which specify how a data will be used, which is a customer data. If data will be meshed or integrated with other programs or other databases, in which case the data changes and data at end point and end state. So data at end point is your end point, not the client's end point. So for instance, if you are a, an online uh, magazine company, uh, you must specify in your terms and conditions when you get subscriber data. Number one, why do you need that data, for instance? If you are doing business, let's say for argument's sake, in Malaysia or Hong Kong or Philippines, and you are getting subscribers from 20 countries, why do you want all of their personal data? All you need is their name, their email address, uh, they are unique identifier, which might be their phone number and of course their credit card details in case you are uh, charging them for it. But if you're not charging them for it, why do you need the credit card details? Why do you need their date of birth? Why do you need their uh, ID number, NRIC number? You don't need all of this, right? So try to weed out stuff that you don't need because the more information you collect, the more liable you become in the eyes of the law. So the, the basic thing is like a lot of uh, EU websites right now, where I subscribe to some of them for regular updates, including Oxford University, they only ask me for my email address. And then they send an email to my email address to verify the email address, that's all. They don't want any other information because the more information they collect, the more liable they become. So think back on why you want to collect all of this information. What will you do with it except keep it with you and then you got to pay for the vault and make sure it is protected. So that's the SLA. Keep the SLA simple. Why bother about ethics? Because when you are collecting data, especially PII data, especially data you don't need, you will go into collection or collation bias. Because just to give you an example, if you're collecting information about me, my date of birth, my gender, my nationality, my ID number, and if I have one or two fields wrong or one or two fields missing, and you input or the algorithm automatically inputs null data or void data, the moment that data is meshed with some other algorithm, it changes all the parameters and then people can do a backtrace on me and find out who I am, you become liable. So that's why ethics is so important. And ethics is also important because you must ensure that the data is accurate. You are accountable for the data you collect. And if there is a breach or non-compliance, there is an external auditor who will come and, and audit and give a report to the PDPA or the GDPR or APEC saying that you were compliant, but the hack didn't happen at your end. It happened because of some other issues related to say your supplier or to somebody else putting in uh, a wrong information on your website or somebody hacking your website, right? So that's, that's the important side that people miss. Also, because a lot of algorithms are now coming with embedded AI and hackers are getting very smart and they are adding their own algorithms or hacks to some of these, uh, some of these uh, programs. And then suddenly you have a lot of data leaking out, especially PII data. And then suddenly you become non-compliant because a hacker may go in and steal uh, credit card numbers or call up people or sell the data to somebody else who calls you up and says, I want to sell you this underwear or whatever. 
and you say, how the hell did you get my number? And then he says, oh, I got it from this website, which is run by this uh, publishing company. And therefore I will complain to PDPC and they go after you. So that's how the whole cycle works. <clears throat> okay, my final slide is on AI ethics. The reason I want to show you this is because this is a unique work that is done in Singapore, the first country in uh, Asia Pacific. We have come up with the AI ethics and governance body of knowledge. This is the website. You can go there. You can download a lot of material. Some material is paid for. Uh, I mean, you got to pay for it. It's it's thirty dollars Singapore dollars for uh, downloading the entire body of knowledge. Uh, if you are interested in that, please go and check out this site. So just to give you an idea of what this site contains, it has thirty authors, twenty five reviewers, twenty five case studies of. Uh, various issues related to AI ethics, uh, 22 chapters, seven sections, uh, and it has got some VIP contributors who have contributed exclusive articles to this. Mr. S. Iswaran used to be Singapore's Minister for Information and Communications. Mr. V. K. Raja is a former Supreme Court Justice who heads the advisory panel on uh, ethical use of data and AI under the government of Singapore. Dr. Yaakov Ibrahim used to be our former Minister of Communications and Information. Dr. Tan Eng Chai is the President of the National University of Singapore. Dr. Subra Suresh is the President of the Nanyang Technological University, which is NTU. Dr. Yeo Kung Kiong is the Asia Pacific chairman of the Asia Pacific Society of Cardiologists. And he's talking about basically medical ethics in an exclusive article that is written for the BOK. Dr. James Yip is the chief data analyst and advisor to the Ministry of Health, Government of Singapore. Mr. Yong Zikin is the deputy commissioner of the PDPC, which is uh, Personal Data Protection Agency uh, Commission of uh, Singapore. And Dr. Chong Yok Sin is the president of the Singapore Computer Society. So these people have written exclusive articles on AI ethics and how the breach uh, of these AI ethics can cause problems for the organization and the individual. And this is my last ever slide. This is my email address. Please feel free to email me anytime on any device, anywhere, and I, res I guarantee to get back to you within six hours. Thank you very much, and back to you, Juni. Thank you very much, Raju. Uh, I, I suppose you mean uh, six working hours. <laughs> yes, six working hours. Sorry. I know we work around the clock, but <laughs> across time. As a journalist, so. we, are, we are used to deadlines, right? So. Yes, we are. <laughs> and of course, we are, we are joined uh, today by, by folks uh, as far as we as, uh, as, as Germany and, uh, and Mozambique and, and of course around ASEAN as well and in the Pacific Islands like Fiji. Uh, so welcome those who have joined us uh, midway during uh, Raju's uh, presentation, very comprehensive presentation. Welcome. Uh, this is the session, of course, and Raju has just gone through examples of you know, what is PII uh, according to different, uh, different jurisdictions. There are differences, as you can see from his his uh, presentation. Uh, so he went through regulations in, uh, across the region in, in the various countries. In fact, we've got quite a few participants uh, from these various countries that he just mentioned, just now, such as uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, Myanmar, Philippines. Uh, and then he also talked, touched a bit about the GDPR as well, which of course, uh, which of course caused such a there was so much news about it, you know, when it was first introduced, because the repercussions of, of GDPR, of course, reverberate worldwide. And of course, uh, you know, what he has shown us today has also uh, show, shown us the, the importance of data privacy and security as well. And um, and he also mentioned uh, the APEC, uh, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation uh, cross border privacy rules as well, which are little known, but uh, you know have. Uh, have have nine princi privacy principles that we should take note of as well. Um, Raju, there are some very specific uh, specific questions regarding your presentation. Do you really want to take them now before we go into discussion? Sure. Because they're, sure. they're very specific questions. Um, yeah, let, let's. Uh, you know, there's a, question, a straightforward question of when the CBPR was enacted. 
when was it enacted as far as i know it was enacted in it came into effect sometime in 2015 i don't know when it was enacted but uh, singapore for instance joined it around 2015 or 2016 and and uh, we've also someone who's noticed that a major country that's not in the cbpr group is india and why is that that is because india is not part of apec yeah so only apec countries, countries yeah only um, apec countries are uh, part of this Yeah. yeah, and you mentioned that uh, we have a question here, so from from Beni in Malaysia. Uh, who enforces CBPR? You said it's it's a little known. So you know, has there been yeah. any enforcement around it? So enforcement of uh, CBPR is by specific countries. So if your data is breached, let's say Singapore uh, data is breached in Myanmar, or not say Myanmar, I mean take Malaysia for instance. So somebody can complain to the APEC Secretariat and. it will get forwarded to pdpc in malaysia to take action mm-hmm. so apec does not enforce itself it's only like a mailman uh, and it will it will get individual countries who are signatories to enforce it on a case by case basis yeah especially i mean enforcement is not like they are they are not like uh, eu they don't want to slap you in the face or whatever they want to figure out have you really had any problems when the data was leaked and what damage has it caused and so on right so unless it has caused any substantial damage to you then they will take action mm. okay and and uh, there's a question from alentan uh, how should governments be subject to local privacy ordinance i, I know in like singapore government is not uh, subject to the yes no it is true governments are subject to it because ihis is a government entity in the, under the government of singapore it uh, it comes right under the ministry of health so it was fined because of breach of uh, uh, its data singtel is a is not a government entity but a glc which is a government linked company and it was fined the maximum of 2 million dollars so it is true that governments must be uh, i mean for two reasons government must be held accountable or government agencies number one government agencies are the ones who collect the most pii for instance of the citizens and number two many government agencies are very lax in their cyber security or privacy protocols or controls so unless a few uh, government agencies are publicly you know hold up uh, i won't say shamed but at least hold up only then will the other government agencies wake up right okay thanks and uh, okay there's another question on natural person must uh, for gdpr this is under the gdpr yeah. section that you went through just now uh, of course gdp uh, natural person refers to someone who's alive does this mean yeah. that the pii of people who are not uh, who are dead is not covered so the pii of somebody who's dead is considered null and void under gdpr the natural person must be alive for action to be taken and for uh, for breach for instance if you are a dead person and your data was breached there is no way you can get any uh, commitment or yeah you can from, see because so so if your your personal information goes up and you lived here yes uh, this uh, Maybe unless your descendants can unless your de- descendants can show that your personal information was used to harm them then they become natural persons who are taking action you see and therefore they are, they are enforceable thank you very much uh, raju maybe this would be the, a good time now to uh, to to start our next sec- sec- segment which is the panel discussion and i'd like to of course uh, invite our panelists uh, from malaysia and singapore onto the stage as well okay and I'd like to introduce you all now to because raju you all know already who's covered uh, the examples of pi regulations and um, of course the importance of data privacy and security our panel now will also have asked them to share with us best practices in safeguarding subscriber data and tips to install you know data protection culture in newsrooms and of course across news organizations with us today uh, joining us from malaysia is nicholas sangau chief product officer of 
Red Media Group uh, and president of the Malaysian Digital Association. Uh, let me just run through very quickly uh, Nick's uh, background and bio. Uh, he is a first chief product officer and uh, of Red Media Group, which is a digital arm of Malaysia's largest media conglomerate, Media Prima Berhad. He drives strategy implementation and operations of the group's digital products, contributing to the group's overall vision to be a leading digital first content and commerce company in Singapore, in Malaysia. And um, in the recent years, Nick has set up various digital initiatives in, within the group, such as Media Prima Labs, which is the in-house incubator, and uh, has been a big champion of esports content and tournaments such as Kajohanan Isukan Campus, which is Malaysia's largest national intervarsity tournament, and My Game On, which is uh, Malaysia's number one gaming portal. And also he set up uh, IGN Southeast Asia, which is the group's first regional games uh, content for Ray. So, you know, various, uh, he also drives video partnerships as well at Media Prima. And of course, his area is of digital product and innovation games, app development, esports, corporate innovation, and startups as well. Um, we have with us from the Philippines, uh, from Rappler, head of digital strategy, and also concurrently the data privacy officer. And data protection and risk management at Rappler, Gemma Mendoza. Thank you, uh, Gemma, so much for joining us uh, from the Philippines. It's such a pleasure to have you join us. Uh, and also, uh, of course, Rappler, we, we, we always um, admire you know, for being you know, digital, digital first, digital native, and doing lots of interesting things as well in terms of content. Gemma herself um, is uh, leading Rappler's multi-pronged efforts to address uh, disinformation as well in digital media and harnessing big data research, fact-checking, also running community workshops. She's also one of Rappler's founding team, um, helping to set up tech systems and initiating strategic projects that connect journalism and data with citizen action, particularly in relation to disasters, elections, and other social concerns. And uh, Gemma herself is an award-winning uh, author as well and journalist. So um, panelists, maybe we can start with a few. Um, if you can all start uh, speaking, uh, give us maybe we can start with uh, Gemma, then we go to Nick. Um, what is it like in your companies and in your countries uh, in terms of uh, protecting data and you know how how do we put in place these best practices? Yeah, in the Philippines, we have um, our own data protection, data privacy act. It was enacted in 2012, and um, basically, um, uh, since and, and of course, um, even when um, even when you're just when we're talking about um, data, particularly for digital, we are conscious that we are not just covered by that we are um, not just potentially covered by our data protection laws, but there's also their users um, by virtue of the fact that we are a purely digital company, we're conscious of um, other laws out there, uh, other domains out there, other uh, locations out there where um, we have users. So that's something that we're very conscious of. Um, and so we're we're trying to as much as we can to to make sure uh, we're compliant. Of course, um, I don't know if um, we we we're striving. It's um it's an ongoing process. Um, not yet. Um, I, I would really I, I there's a lot that still needs to be done. But the first thing we really did um because it's really challenging for organizations, particularly small organizations who have like uh, where where people have to share for um various like you know, uh, adopt various roles um, to, to be, um, you know, looking into data privacy and implementing this ma major, um, like, initiative. So the first thing really, like, uh, that we undertook was making sure that we have, um, we, we are, that the organization is aware of it. So the first thing is uh, having that data culture in place. And uh, how we did it is to uh, make sure it, at the outset we have, uh, we did quite a number of briefings, and we can we continue to do that. Like every now and then, there's a refresher for for new members of the team, and um, also for um, uh, any updates that are available out there that would affect us. So that that's very important because typically, like you know, within an organization, you have uh, different roles, right? Um, particularly in a news organization, so you have the reporters, you have sales, you have the marketing people, you have the the uh, promotion the uh, community people in our case because we have a se separate community team and and um those things uh could be at cross purposes you know um i mean um unless uh, people are are uh, on the same boat like um there everybody is aligned on, on on the concerns 
what are the possibilities within the framework of available laws and within um, ethical frameworks. Um, and, and from there, we can then come up with like, how do we do? How do we, uh, uh, you know, strategize? Because really, um, if you are not conscious of it, um, and that's not something you take into consideration as part of strategy, there, there can be problems. Um, so it, it, that's the first thing. The, the, the other thing is to make sure we're compliant. So in our in the Philippines, there's a requirement for companies that process uh, personally uh, personal information of people. It's over I mean like over one thousand individuals. Um, and um, I think because we're we, we we recognize we have a lot of users at Rappler. So what we did uh, first and foremost was we make sure we registered. So I'm the I'm the registered. Uh, uh, data protection officer uh, for the company. And um, the first thing there was to like really like, I mean, to begin with is that, like take the first steps to, to registering, to making sure you're compliant. And then uh, from there, it's like reviewing every process then um, and, and looking at like, okay, where, uh, at what points do we collect personally identifiable data? Do we even need, as, as, as Raju mentioned, do we even need, uh, you know, sensitive data or can that be processed by third, uh, I mean, like, for instance, um, credit card information. I don't want that in my systems. <laughs> it can be done. It can be handled by something, a, a, a different service that already has that. So, um, which, which means I don't have to store it. Um, I just need, uh, so things like that, those kinds of uh, decisions, are, are important because then um, that manages risk for us. Um, the other thing that we made sure of, because we are also building, still building the platform um, and up to now, we're, we're, uh, we're integrating, we're in the process of integrating other mechanisms for the community. Um, and what we make sure of is um, we're looking at all of these things from the data uh, protection lens. So it's um, like looking at the design itself or even the designers are conscious of privacy by design. And then at every point of collection of data, we integrate mechanisms by which people are, there's a disclosure, people are uh, in, in an acceptance of the data collection. And um, there's a disclosure on why uh, the data is necessary and what we will use the data for. So, um, yeah, uh, those are mostly what we try to do. I mean, it's not, it's an ongoing process. I wouldn't say that we're perfect <laughs> yet, but uh, that's really what we are conscious of because there's also been quite a lot of, um, uh, you know, data leaks here in the Philippines. I think one of the biggest leaks was the, the leak of the uh, data of uh, uh, voters uh, in, in the 2016 elections, going to the 2016 elections. So, um, very very conscious of that that um that we need to be very uh conscious of what we're doing with our data and our data collection as well but um the other thing though as a news organization is we're also very conscious that while we're um while we're protecting our user data we're still distinguishing um data collection that is needed by the newsroom to operate um, and to and and both um, we're talking here about um, information we collect about the subject matters of our users uh, of our of our stories um, and um, and all of uh, and other matters. So there's a um, all of those things are things that we consider. Yeah, thanks so much, Gemma. So from um, one, we'll, you know, we've got some questions coming in, but maybe we'll go to Malaysia first. From one small newsroom, we go to, um, well, Nick, Nicholas case is not a newsroom, but it's a, it's a media conglomerate and it's the digital arm of pets. So Nicholas, would you like to share with us now what are some of these practices that you put in place? Yeah, uh, thank you for having us uh, on, the, on the call. It's very, like, having, looking at the Raiju's uh, you know, slides, I'm, I'm learning quite a lot of new things in the slide as well. Uh, so, so we are in, in Media Prima. Uh, of course, we've got multiple touch points that requires uh, data, right? Uh, from our from our consumer audience, uh, we have uh, quite a, quite a large, uh, you know, home to shopping, TV, uh, you know, uh, business, and we have like you know subscription service. We have a T-bot service. And so across the board, so we, we have multiple companies doing different different things, different product, right? So one of the few things that we we've, we've started to to do. 
uh, about maybe about four or five years ago is to really look at bringing uh, data expert into the into the into the into the group organization, right? Uh, before that, we, we we used to just being managed by you know IT guys in the, in the background, and and a lot of time you don't even know like what happens to the data until until something happens, right? Uh, you know, so 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 when the the the, the data protection uh, act came about, so we took it seriously and brought uh, a few expert uh, on board, uh, and what that. Uh, happen uh, directly after that impact is that you know our data team came up with you know internal uh, data governance policy uh, you know to secure our data across the board. Uh, some basic example that you can you know you can be related relate to, for example, you know we have standard fields that we ask for across the group. Uh, you know we have like uh, seven or 40, 49 different products. Uh, you know, but we we keep the fields standard. Uh, so for example, we don't take IC. Uh, at the very initial period of just collecting data of you know logging in service to some uh, portal right but of course you know as you go on you know, doing purchase or anything that we need a bit more sensitive then then we go deeper into the into the into into the into more fields uh, like similar like what Gemma said we, we work very closely you know with uh, payment gateway who people are more secure than us as a media group they, they know how to handle the data more than us uh, so we work with you know trusted partners to handle that uh, you know because in in, in Malaysia, happened a few times where you know you know there's no big uh, you know uh, penalty or somebody got caught, but we notice the pattern uh, you know it happens in a in a third party provider that works for you, uh, right? You transfer the data to them and they were doing something for you, and then something you know something at the end they didn't have a proper governance and it got leaked out. So that's why we're very we're very picky with partners we work with and where we release the data uh, to. Uh, and especially that's something that you know a bit more than the PII uh, more more sensitive, right? Uh, so that's one uh, governance within the group, uh, and and the second is like we have multiple layer of uh, security uh, that that you know the data team and and the, and the the server administrative guys are actually managing their like you know layers of VPN, you know user of private keys going to the server, uh, even OS level, you know what database level certain teams can can access. Uh, even I don't have access to a lot of data. I can I I always tell the team just give me that dashboard to see an overview. Don't give me you know, depth that I can go and click and look at more detail. I just need a dashboard. So for example, for management, we just give them a dashboard. Uh, you know, they can see from overview of what the numbers are and they don't really go into the detail of the, the audience. Uh, and we use a lot of data in general for our uh, our marketing. Uh, we have a DMP, uh, data management platform. Uh, you know, we, we work with, uh, again, uh, trusted partners, trusted, trusted platform like Lotomy. Uh, so stuff like that, and, and, and even in like softwares like Lotomy or you know the DMP that are used to handle uh, you know private data, right? They, they have very good governance as well. Uh, I give an example like you know for the DMP that we use, uh, if we're accidentally you know uh, you know enter anything PII or anything sensitive into the DMP, actually the whole system will freeze. Uh, so that means we can't use a machine, we can't use a system, the software for a couple of days, and we have to purge it out. Uh, and then we have to access it again. So it, it gives a lot of, you know, for the guys who's handling the, you know, the data, give them a lot more to think about before they're doing, uh, you know, action uh, with with any of our data. Uh, and, and I think one of the, probably the last thing that you know is, as uh, 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 you know, uh, Juni was saying, <laughs> we're a large organization, and when it cut across, we 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 make it uh, we make it uh, a practice that every quarter we will, every every year, uh, even, even we will have an external audit and probably do a penetration test on, on, on where our storage are, how our contents are handled. And I can tell you, uh, you know, when we started this uh, external audit, we found quite a bit of loophole uh, in the organization and we started to close them up. Uh, as we go along, you know, when, when, when the audit are, are done again, we, we tend to get better and better uh, across, across the board. Uh, but I think in terms of usage across the board, like you know, Gemma was saying, it's pretty much uh, accountable, accountability, right? A lot of people in organization probably use the data, but they are not aware of what's PDPDA and then what's what's the fi fine for it, right? Uh, it's, it's so it's best to do engagement uh, because this thing is quite an accountability process around the organization. It's just really a large one, right? You know, knowing what you can do and and you know, you suddenly see your colleague. Uh, negotiating a deal that you know that is not you know safe with, with the uh, data protection, right? You can raise up, uh, you can just uh, bump it up. Hey, uh, you know it's not right, you know this kind of stuff. So, so it's a pretty much accountability. But with accountability, 
everyone needs to know what are the you know what are the you know what are the rules and impact that that that, that they need to be uh, pretty much uh, aware of. Yeah, that's what we we're generally doing in in in, uh, in in our in our large group. Thanks a lot, Nick. Um, Raju, do you have any uh, remarks or comments? Anything to add to what uh, two speakers have said? Yeah, so there are two things which uh, which came up. One is in the newsroom, why do people need to see all the PII, right? The newsroom's job is to send out news items, or features, or articles. It's the marketing department or the circulation department that needs to contact people to find out what to upsell to them. But even they don't need anything beyond just the email address and the phone number. Therefore, the first point that Gemma made was accurate. Why do you need to collect all of that information? And secondly, why do you need to even collect credit card information? So like uh, Nicholas made the right point, if you are collecting credit card information because your, your product is available as a service for money, give that job to the bank or to a payment gateway. Let them handle that data. Therefore, at least you are compliant and if there is an attack on that supplier that supplier has to answer not you so my view is as a newspaper company you don't need all that pii in fact you don't need 99 percent of the information that you collect from your subscriber you only need his or her email address and maybe phone number just in case you need to authenticate the email address because probably in some case the the phone number changes or the email address changes so how do you authenticate that right so the best way to do that is to add a security question which is not pii again because a security question is attempted by you the, both the question and the answer for instance what's your mother's maiden name can be replaced with which school did you first attend? What was your pet's name? What was your first job? Which company was it? In? So that is not PII. Therefore, even all these minor tweaks can keep you very safe from the law. That's the most important point I think I would like to emphasize. Thanks. Thanks for all the, the great suggestions. But the definition of PII differs, like you highlighted earlier, even between, say, Singapore and Malaysia, you know, there, there are differences with the Philippines and, and so on. Like, for example, cell phone numbers are not PII in Malaysia. Cell phone yeah. numbers are PII. In Singapore. In Singapore, but, uh, in in Singapore as well as Malaysia, as well as uh, GDPR. So a lot of stuff is PII. However, the reason you need a cell phone number is for indexing. Mm -hmm. no, otherwise, how do you index a person's name? You need some indexing number, right? So the cell phone number is a unique number because cell phone numbers are not shared. However, that's the only PII you have. And the reason you can say uh, if there is a non-compliance is that you need it for indexing purposes only and not for calling. The moment you use that phone number to call or you sell that phone number, you are in non-compliance. But you use it only to index a person, that is fine. Yeah, but the in regards to with regards to say harmonizing or uh, there are different definitions in different jurisdictions as well. Right. So and everyone I guess goes for the, the highest. I I just want to add here. Mm -hmm. Um, a big part of this is consent. So in effect, um, if they consent for us to contact them, that's fine. Um, I mean, I mean, obviously, like we, we, so it's so this is really why, um, in every data collection point, um, it's important to have those, um, uh, those consent. So, um, for instance, um, we, we organize a lot of, uh, uh, workshops. And what we ask people to do is, okay, um, take this box if you want us to, to keep you informed about, about our workshops so so they do that they take the box because they're motivated they want to um they want to attend the workshops in the future because it's learning uh, opportunity for them so it's really like um part of it is so um, i i also don't want that don't think we should be looking at this as something really like from a punitive perspective but looking at this also as how do you do this how do you manage information about users in a way that is fair to them 
um, at the end of the day, it's really about being fair. Like, okay, um, I collect the mobile numbers if um, for a reason and the person who who gives me that mobile number needs to know what the reason is and they need to cons uh, to to agree to that that, that this is fine like um, it's fine for you to call to collect my number and then we uh, reach out to me uh, for that reason that we agreed upon so um this is really um the reason why it's important to have that orientation um and um, what that's really what we did like really like what are the parameters by which we can use this data and um and we need to be very dis uh, really I, know, I think one of the things that people need to understand within the organization this is the first thing thing we ma made sure people understand is this what's the difference between personally identifiable data <laughs> and the sensitive <laughs> personally identifiable data so that's that's the first thing that people needed to understand Yep, and there are differences as well, like Malaysia, for example, has you know um, sensitive data like health conditions and political religious beliefs uh, and, and so on. Uh, some questions here uh, regarding the cell phone number. Uh, there's one question here about uh, how to explain, uh, you know, how would one explain that the cell phone number is used for indexing and is this something that a regulator would ask? I know the point made by Gemma about uh, you know, consent, but still, maybe Raju, you can elaborate a little bit more about the use of uh, cell phone numbers for indexing. Yes. So Gemma made a very important point, which is consent. So let us take for argument's sake, it is uh, Gemma's organization, right, Rappler, which takes my cell phone number and I consent to give it to them. And Rappler calls me in case there is an issue or a problem with my account, which is fine. The moment Rappler sells my cell phone number and my name to another organization, that is yes. where the problem arises. So if Rappler uses it for itself, I have given consent. Mm -hmm. I have Don't not given consent. consent. Yes, I have yes. not given consent for Rappler to sell my information to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So that's the distinction. So coming back to the technical side, right? Why do you need a cell phone number for indexing? Because you need to index somebody based on some identifier, which is unique. So email, for instance, may not be absolutely unique because email changes and keeps changing cell phone numbers change very rarely and you need an index file to say that this person mr raju is identified by this cell phone number but both are private and confidential and pii but the only thing that's not private is the email address so email address can be given out to everybody so if you have seen none of the the compliances include email address because email address, you can have multiple email addresses, right? You can have five Gmail addresses. I have two Proton mail addresses and I have Gmail and I have a few other email addresses, but it depends which email I want to give to whom. However, I have only one unique cell phone number. In the old days, you were indexing people by using their ID, ID which is NRIC, which was banned because the government said you cannot use NRIC for commercial purposes. But you can probably use my cell phone number for commercial purposes only because I give you consent. If I withhold the consent, then you have to give me a very unique identifier, which has nothing to do with my cell phone number. But then how do you contact me in case my email is compromised you see then there are issues right related to the issue of consent uh, there's a question here about what is the best practice of subscribing research leads into your subscriber database research leads Sub uh, research you leads mean? i suppose you have researched them and then uh, you know you maybe found them suitable and are desirable leads and, and then can you so add you them see, but that's why i ask it if, you know so from a legal perspective mm -hmm. If you get my email address by doing, by researching, let's say my name, or you get it from some other source, and you send me one email saying, are you interested in subscribing to this service? We offer these, these, these things. Are you interested to subscribe? If I say yes, then I have given consent. If I don't reply at all, that means you have a right to send me another email. But if I say unsubscribe, or I say don't give me I don't want your service, I am not interested, which means I am withholding consent. 
Now, despite that, if you keep sending me emails after I have expressly said that I don't want your service, that constitutes spam. But that does not constitute a breach of PII. So that is just spam. And the best thing you can do with spam is just delete it because you have no legal recourse. Yeah. So, um, so, so, yeah. yeah I, I just want to add so to this is where the distinction lies like uh, news organizations um particularly digital news organizations um are are uh, basically like uh, platforms right um and and that, that by by virtue of being platforms then you're you're collecting user data which is distinct from the news gathering role Right, so I'm I'm thinking that the question about research has to do and is related to the news gathering role, and that's a different issue. So it's it's much the same as when we also collect information about person uh, about persons of interest. So we collect information about persons of interest because those are persons of public interest because we write about them, and usually there's um there's this distinction there where there's public interest in that person. Usually, that person is a public official or or even uh, celebrities, right? So, I, I think that should be distinct, and we need to make sure that this that is distinct from where um, you're already using the information for your commercial operations. Meaning, like as Raju was saying, um, yeah, you're sending them <laughs> newsletter subscriptions already. That's different. So, so a couple of questions here about uh, again specifics. You know, one is, is about if a subscriber consents to giving their phone number. Um, phone number is in this case is it still considered PII? I suppose <laughs> yes, it's still a piece of PII. Yes, phone number is PII. Yeah, but the the person has consented to give you right, so which is fine for the purposes that you are you say you're going to use it for. Yes. So, yeah. And then no, uh, no. so purpose purpose may or may not be apparent. For instance, I give my phone number to say Rappler, which gives Rappler the right to call me and sell me some stuff or SMS me or ask me if I am interested in a WhatsApp conversation. So the purposes can be different. However, I have given consent to only Rappler. I have not given consent for Rappler to sell it to anybody else. So yeah. that, that distinction must be maintained. Secondly, to, to just quickly add to Gemma's point about newsmakers. So persons of interest are newsmakers. These are public figures. And for public figures, there are different uh, modes of PII because a public figure is, is supposed to be in the public domain, right? Yeah. So his, his information, unless it is PII, which is guarded by an organization, like say the government, that is not considered breach. Because if you, if I try to contact a public figure through whichever way, as a news person, I have a full right to do so. And it doesn't constitute breach of PII. Well, related yeah. to this actually is the, the question here in the Q&A box from Alan Tan. Uh, it says the problem with consent is that consumers generally do not understand what they are agreeing to. Often the motivation is to get something at the point of the interaction for the first time. Uh, the consumer has no idea how his or her data is going to be subsequently used. So when a telemarketer calls a consumer's mobile number without knowing the person, uh, Alan's asking why is this not the violation of privacy? But privacy, I think, is, is a different, uh, talking about sort of a different thank you yeah so it's a privacy issue so there are i mean countries like singapore have a dnr you know a dnc sorry do not call registry so if i add my number to the government's do not call registry and somebody still calls me i have somewhere to complain to that is invasion of privacy but it's not invasion of pii see the telemarketer i can block his number right with the spam email, I can delete it or put it into spam or uh, put a marker there that all of these e emails must be deleted. However, with a phone number, if somebody keeps calling me, there are ways for me to block the phone number on my phone or I can call my uh, phone service provider and ask them to take action. Or in worst case scenario, for instance, money lenders keep calling people on their phone lines, you can make a police report and the police will go after that person, hopefully. 
so that is not a breach of PII. That's a, just a breach of privacy, uh, individual privacy. PII, to be very clear, is a set of information that identifies you as who you are for companies to take some action to benefit themselves and not necessarily to you. So that's a very vague uh, legal definition. I'm not a lawyer. I'm just uh, repurposing what I what I have read. Yeah. And there was also one more question, which, which I just found out, which I was partly right. When did CBPR start? Yeah, I was right that it started in 2015, 2016, but it first came into effect in 2005. But it was only started to be implemented in 2015 by countries. Uh, Singapore started implementing it in 2016. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying. Uh, Nicholas, anything to add? No, I mean, just just uh, interesting to you know hear. I think a lot of the questions are you know from probably from consumer point of view, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, going back to educating a consumer is one of the best things in, in each of the country. Uh, you know, telling them, you know, what to sign up for, right? And when you when you when you sign up for something, you must make, make sure that you at least you scan through the the, the terms and conditions, terms and conditions. Uh, within that and then knowing what you sign up for. Uh, and I think it's responsibility for, uh, you know, for organization as well to uh, really uh, share if you sign up for this, what we will get uh, for 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 us for a large group like us. When we do a sign up, we make sure it's part of the media prima group sign up. So across the board, we could you know we could offer other services uh, across the group. You when you are uh, okay to submit your you know email uh, to us. Uh, yeah, and I think there was a question on uh, how to turn people into subscription and unsubscriber, uh, right? The, the uh, leads. So, yeah, research I think it's, yeah. yeah, so this this question is uh, pretty much uh, if I get the context right, it's it's a very marketer kind of kind of mindset, yeah. right? You so a lot of our marketing guys, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of my marketing guys, like why can't I just get everything else at the at the at the, at the first step, right? Mm -hmm. Which is which everything. again also uh, can be backfire, right? Because if I need to fill up mm -hmm. a lot more when you start the process, then I don't, uh, you know, it, I, I'm giving too much to you, right? So what are the steps that we always do is, uh, like I said earlier. Uh, pick field that you need first and as they go along and interact with you into a transaction you can actually continue to ask more questions as, as you go in uh, it's more, more efficient way and uh, better user consumer for 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 the for the user yeah and um i, I just want to add uh jen um uh i, I think uh, at the at the end of the day it's really um corporate ethics also when you're talking of um um data privacy and um, it's also like, uh, and, and that ethic has to be something that has to be like an imbibe by the rest of the organization. It's like looking at, okay, um, like it's not even about compliance only, but it's also like, as I said earlier, about like, um, like uh, what do you, what is, what do we think is the ethical use of our um, consumer data? Part of what we try to do also is to educate our, uh, our users on how I mean, like, okay, what what is a cookie to begin with? <laughs> just I just sent an email about it, like, okay, how do we use cookies? Things like that. It's it's really like um being conscious of it to begin with that oh hey there there are these little data collection devices. Like also educating our users on how can they opt out, how they can they clear cookies, for instance, because there's a way to do that. Right, but how can they do that? Like making sure that that's part of the things, the communication between the company and uh, as a media group and uh, and and its users. Um, and yeah, uh, definitely uh, part of that is uh, like uh, no no for us is selling the data of our users. We definitely don't do that. Yeah. So from an ethical standpoint, of course, you, you want to give that assurance. You are a trusted brand. It is for your reputation. You're a credible news organization. You're responsible. Uh, and of course, they can trust you with the data. So it's yes. to do with corporate reputation. Uh, there was a comment, of course, uh, to say that the NRIC is an immutable number. At least the phone number is mutable, can change, can always get a new number, but it's not possible to get a national ID, of course. Uh, but of course, you know, NRICs are no, no, you know, it's, and it's information that honestly, we as uh, news organizations do not need to, in this case, uh, collect 
and, and it, like uh, to take a, I guess a, a leaf from what Raju said, the more information you collect, the more liable you become. So best not to collect. But I, I did have a question about the relationship between subscriber data and advertising, because uh, I'm sure now news organizations are kind of in a way going down this path. They are collecting quite a lot of subscriber data, which in turn, of course, how, depending on how you word your uh, your your uh, your consents also uh, your, the marketing department obviously want this data as well for for various reasons just straightforward marketing and of course uh, selling some further subscriptions and of course uh, targeting of advertising because now we are we're looking at we're in the age of the expiry of the third party cookie and therefore uh, news organizations are moving towards uh, building up their first party data and therefore this. Uh, you know, there's a lot of data you're going to be dealing with. The marketers want more. We, of course, as uh, as people who are implementing, do not want to collect too much data. How do you all sort of balance uh, these tensions? Uh, so one of the things that we we, we do quite quite a bit uh, within a large uh, stack of product, and I think even in like you know medium sized uh, product offering as well, it, it can be done. Is really to think about uh, having your first party data uh, uh, tracking across your site. Uh, meaning, you know, if the third, uh, uh, the third party cookie goes away, you technically will be able to uh, offer similar uh, experience to, to the consumer. Uh, so, so that's something that we, we, we've been doing quite a bit, you know, knowing that, you know, the, 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 the cookie will go away. Uh, but it is also very important not in, in this exercise is to make sure that it benefits the user rather than so much benefit the marketing team or us doing our, our targeting. Uh, you know, things like improving recommendation service uh, on, your, on, a, on the same page. Uh, things like, you know, uh, you know, displaying the right news when you are on, on, on their site. You know, things that saves time for consumer or getting people to a bit more engaged with the content that we put together. So it doesn't necessarily just because we want to collect, we want to track people. Uh, I mean, it has to give good, good uh, you know, good benefit to the user, right? With, with that, they, they, wouldn't, they, they will continue to trust the organization. Uh, and in making sure that you know uh, in in the future th there will be a potential that you can uh, make them as, as a subscriber as well. Uh, yeah, so I think if it's if you have a, a good balance uh, for you know benefit for them and also benefit for your organization, I'm pretty sure like the, the collecting of data in in doing uh, marketing uh, newsletter uh, central will be a much easier seamless process rather than. Uh, a process where you're always scared to collect or not to collect, you know, uh, uh, yeah. what to target or not to target, uh, you know, across your, your platform. Because at the end of the day, it's 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 pretty much business, right? You're gonna make yeah. your you're gonna make your your living, you know, through the through advertising on your platform. You still have uh, advertisers, right yeah. 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 still got advertisers uh, <laughs> to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gemma, uh, Julie, I so, think. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go, go ahead. ahead first. Oh, ladies first. <laughs> No. So basically, why? what's going away with the third-party cookie? One, one thing that could go away is um, interest segments, which is something that marketers use, right? Um, because um, that usually is based on multiple sites, behavior across multiple sites. And um, um, that's why people are starting to look at first-party data. And um, at, at the end of the day, um, I, I agree with Nicholas here um, that what is really important here is to um, be clear on the value and then deliver on the value um, to the user. Because it's really like um, um, if you're collecting this data, is this data actually delivering the value you promised? Um, I think people, when when they see that, then they'll, they'll be okay with it. And again, uh, provided that the data is only used um, and is not abused used for the purposes that um, that was disclosed and not abused. The other thing to really consider to, to always keep in mind, I think here is um, that um, they need to feel that they can always delete that data. And, and this one we communicate that even when we um, when we subscribe, they have that option to delete. In fact, when we launched a recent campaign, um, we really communicated why, like why are we uh, asking you to register? Um, we we want to build up a deeper relationship with you. We want to know if you're if, what information you like, um, and what we can, what you want to, um, what you are really interested in. Things like that. It's important to not just take, 
but also give. <laughs> and that, val- that, that balance of value and, and what they give is important. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we have two related questions to that, but Roger, did you want to make mm-hmm. your point first? And then we'll yeah, so, the so part of the point, point was addressed by Gemma. Mm-hmm. Uh, from a legal perspective, you must have an unsubscribe button mm-hmm. on your website, which allows people to stop getting your service, you know, and you must honor that. So you have to automate the unsubscribe. The moment I say unsubscribe me, it should automatically delete my email from your database. That's number one. Number two, in Nicholas's case, he's talking about a slew of products. Let's say if I sign up with him once, I have technically signed up with seven of his products where I may not be interested in all seven. I may be interested in two. So one way to get out of that issue is to give me an option to unsubscribe by ticking what I want or I don't want. So opt-in is a better method than opt-out because it keeps you in the clear in legal terms. So the best way is for somebody like me to be asked to go to a website on Prima and said, please tick all the services that you would like. And I tick four out of seven and therefore legally I get four and therefore the the Prima group is sufficiently in compliance because I have consented to receive all four and plus I will have the option anytime to cancel any one of those four or to join something else you know so the options are very very important and giving the subscriber the last say is the most important part Uh, the, the big problem in many companies is the moment I unsubscribe, it doesn't automatically unsubscribe me. It goes to some human being who then decides, oh, why should I unsubscribe? You know, let it go on. You see, that's where the problem <laughs> and arises. And they can lodge the complaint. Yeah. Yes, then you are in non-compliance. So that's related to uh, the couple of questions here. Uh, One says, for a news organization, as mentioned, uh, newsletter subscription is offered, but to sustain the business, of course, marketing sends out collaterals as well uh, to these subscribers. At what stage should we distinguish a newsletter subscriber who's interested in the newsletter only versus one who's interested in receiving newsletter as well as marketing collaterals? And how does the organization distinguish between these two groups of subscribers? Maybe Raju has already addressed it by saying uh, you can tick uh, the menu and the options. Yeah, it's the descriptions. <laughs> it's um, how you describe how you, how you de- describe the uh, mecha- uh, different, um, you know, opt-ins. Yeah, and you're consenting to those. So uh, yeah. for those, mm-hmm. that wording is very important. And then uh, I think there's another follow-up to, uh, on the question of researched leads. Is it enough to send a welcome email with the option for them to unsubscribe from the newsletter? And this is, I guess, goes to the suggestion of the delete button. Mm-hmm. Is, is that enough if you are uh, unsort of, this is unsolicited, so I'm, I'm guessing from the sounds of it, mm. you research these people, you find them suitable uh, target, targets, uh, is it sufficient to send them a welcome email unsolicited, but to give them the option to unsubscribe? Yes, so as far as email goes, yes, you can send out uh, a million emails, for instance, unsolicited, as mm-hmm. long as your uh, subscribe, I mean, as long as your CSP allows that facility, right? And a bulk of that will go to spam yes. because That's unless <laughs> yeah because automatically gmail or whatever email provider will send it to spam because it's not it's a it's a new person and it's an organization and they know that uh, thousands of these emails are going to gmail addresses all over so it will automatically send to spam then it's up to you to filter out the spam and decide oh you want this or not right so that's the the big issue in uh, from the from the news makers, I mean, from the news publication side, how do I get across my message to all <laughs> these unsolicited uh, potential subscribers? The best way is not actually to send emails, but to have advertisements on your website, give them coupons, give them some benefit as, as Gemma and Nicholas already mentioned, right? Give them some, some peg, for them to visit your site. Probably tell them that, oh, you can attend these seminars for free, or you can download this content for free. You can get this book for free, this ebook for free or something like that, which which interests your target audience, right? So 
so if it is it you you give us a cyber security book for free you will get people who are interested in it and cyber security to try and visit your site to find out the other one is via blogs so don't have just blogs on your site have blogs on linkedin on medium on a huge variety of sites so the blogs are a good way for you to include hyperlinks to your site to your services to your name and that's how people get interested for instance i subscribe to a lot of cyber security newsletters but how do i get to know them because when i read one cyber security newsletter it has a link that says oh if you need more information on this click here or if i like a certain author who writes very well i click on him and i subscribe to him then i get all the emails coming from him so that's how build up the momentum right and all this is legal because i have consented in every case and blogs are a very good medium and many people don't use it because they they just write the blog and they don't include hyperlinks for instance yeah so blogs are a good marketing material as well so i'll stop here great point <laughs> actually i wanted we've got 5 minutes left and and actually no other questions at the moment but i wanted to share this uh, interesting example here of the atlanta journal constitution i i shared a link to their site with my colleague in europe you know because i said this is a great you know example of they done some amazing news marketing uh, for their their uh, campaign to market their their the brand and uh, and then he said i can't see it and because this is the page he gets you know apologies our website is currently unavailable in most european countries due to gdpr rules do do you see this happening uh, i mean of course in, we are in a, in a region that doesn't have this sort of practice but uh, are these the implications for you know, news providers who do not comply with gdpr would this happen to our asian news publishers for example if they don't comply i mean if i can go first yes this is uh, going to be very common especially if you are attracting audiences from the eu however this is only applicable if your site is hosted in eu if your site let's say is hosted in philippines or singapore or malaysia and you get the occasional uh, person from eu who logs in you are not supposed to be compliant because your site is not meant for eu audiences you know so there is an intent and there is a consent so intent is your intent is that your site is available worldwide but is governed by the jurisdiction of your home country which is say singapore malaysia philippines or whatever the case may be consent is i consent from the eu to receive your information through my through email or whatever push mechanism you have right and i have consented therefore you are in full compliance of gdpr regulations this issue only arises if let's say you are on a cloud platform let's say amazon or azure or whatever and you decide okay i want a, a mirror site of this publication in brussels or in germany or in london then you have to comply with british regulations or with german or which is eu regulations right so that distinction must be maintained i know it's a load balancing issue but can't i say i don't want uh, amazon i'm a, if i'm a yeah, you can't customer say, can't i say i don't want a mirror site in europe yeah you yeah. just direct them to my site in asia absolutely so you you don't have to in fact you must specify when you sign up with amazon that i want only these countries and i want my data center maybe in singapore or malaysia and i am catering to audiences in asean so you are compliant in asean gdp i mean asean cbpr or apec or whatever but you are not compliant with uh, gdpr however that's not your target audience however if you still get audiences from there it's not your fault you are welcome i mean audiences all over the world are welcome to like i have a website which where i have uh, a whole host of uh, articles and i get audiences from eu all the time because i write about e gdpr and i tell them that this is not meant for i mean this is not targeted at you and i am not i am not also capturing any uh, pii for instance right so you can go to my website it's very simple rajuchalam.com you will see a whole lot of articles uh, and links and so on and it also has uh, some idea of what i am collecting and why am i collecting and i am not asking 
you to subscribe or anything. I am not sending out any push notifications. It's a passive site for you to come and look at the stuff that I have written. If you don't like it, don't come anymore. But I am not going to push anything to you. Plus, I specify I am not collecting any PII. So that is important, you see. Any comment, last comments from uh, Nicholas Gemma about, you know, something like this where you know, it's, it's a concern at all. I mean, I think Rajiv has explained that if you are hosted in Asia, in a non-GDPR uh, jurisdiction, you may not have to worry about being sort of blocked by, by this. No, no issue, right? I, I don't have anything else. Yeah, it was the first time I've seen something like this <laughs> because, yeah, we're, yeah, we're not. Quite a bit. But I, I was so quite taken by surprise, you know, when my European colleagues, I can't read it. <laughs> I was like, wow, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, but I think great points, Raju, thank you so much. And, and I think we had, we had one comment here also about uh, in Singapore passport numbers can change uh, when you get a new passport. So technically you could use your passport number. But of course now Singapore has just announced that you will extend passports for 10 years instead of five. So it might take <laughs> a bit longer. <laughs> passports are PII, you know. You cannot capture passport numbers. Mm -hmm. You are capturing PII. So it's a more dangerous thing to capture passport numbers than capturing phone numbers. Mm. So. Thank you for that reminder. Yes. Well, <laughs> I think it brings us to the end of uh, this session. Thank you very much to our panelists uh, for taking the questions. And I think we learned a lot. It, this is, of course, not a technical session. It is meant, after all, for, for news uh, staff you know, and, and to be aware of the implications. And the, I guess the questions that you will have to ask as well uh, when you're dealing, talking, discussing these issues with your teams uh, and also dealing with IT. Uh, thanks, Nick, for that point about uh, dealing with your DMPs and you know, sort of things to look out for your DMP in this case would sort of block any PII that's being uploaded. Of course, that also um, is the how you configure it, uh, I suppose. Otherwise, you know, different jurisdictions. So Jimmy, can I can I interrupt? Sure. There is a question for me asking whether uh -huh. my slides will be available. Ah. Do, you, do you have any website where you can upload it? Uh, yes, we will be circulating your deck uh, okay. after this to all those who have registered. So thanks for that question. Yes, we, we will, and you will also get a uh, recording, a link to the recording of this session. That just brings me to, to thank everybody uh, and to wrap up this session as well. It is part of a series of uh, data-related webinars that have been supported by the Google News Initiative. Uh, we call this the Data Garage session. We had uh, sessions on data foundations and data journalism and visualization, and today's session on data privacy in managing substitution. So thank you very much everyone for you, attending today.